Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks from Darren and myself to all of you for coming. It really is greatly appreciated. I know I can speak for the pair of us when I say that we're delighted and humbled to be here in Richmond Barracks, given its incredible history, history that leaps from its walls as well as from the pages of our new book. I'm going to kick things off here by saying a big thanks to the Collins Press, particularly Gillian, who has done so much to organise events this evening, and to Aideen. Where's Aideen? Thanks a million, Aideen. And everyone here at Richmond Barracks for being so accommodating with the launch. Thanks also to the great books, the Orion Press, and of course, a huge thanks to the one and only Marcus Howard who has very kindly agreed to be our guest speaker this evening. But on that note, I'm going to keep this brief so that Marcus can get stuck in. We're delighted to see so many familiar faces, as well as some new ones. It's one of the more rewarding things about writing books like this. Getting to meet some fantastic people, and getting to hear some equally fantastic stories. We've had the good fortune to do plenty of that over the last few years since we embarked on our journey as writers. This book that we're launching, Those of Us Who Must Die, is something that Darren and me are very proud of. It picks up the threads where its predecessor, when the clock struck in 1916, left off. It brings the reader on a similar, gut wrenching, no holds barred, roller coaster ride into the tumultuous events that helped to shape modern Ireland. Those of Us Who Must Die deals with the Easter Rising's aftermath, the roundups, the deportations, the executions, and the ultimate revival of the Republican movement, which followed in the wake of its initial defeat. This is done in a visual and expressive way. It gives a boots on the ground perspective into the intense drama of what happened in Dublin and in the prisons and internment camps of England and Wales between May 1916 and the autumn of 1917, as well as a window into what followed. Seen predominantly through the eyes of the ordinary people, the butchers, the bakers, the engineers, the labourers, the secretaries, the clerks, the solicitors, the mothers, the fathers, the sons, the daughters, the brothers and sisters, the citizen soldiers who set out to achieve the impossible when having lost the first battle, they took up the battle yet again. They suffered terribly under conditions that most of us would struggle to even comprehend. But through that adversity, they displayed astonishing fortitude. Elements of the book are also seen through the eyes of the foot soldiers from the British side. There are no shortage of surprises. These young and not so young men who struck at the British Empire and held out with so little against so many for so long, knowing that the Empire's preoccupation with the First World War presented an unprecedented opportunity for an extraordinary generation. They were prepared to sacrifice everything as they strove to create the iron aspired to in their proclamation. The rising itself tested their mettle. Few were found wanting. But it could in some ways be argued that for the insurgents, the rising was the easy part. For all its dangers in the form of flying bullets, fire and shrapnel, it was at times exhilarating. What came afterwards afforded few such opportunities for exhilaration. However, within the pages of this book, you will witness the undaunted spirit that maintained them as they faced their array of harrowing ordeals showing to us all that the impossible is frequently only so because we believe it to be. For through their tribulations, they did the impossible. They overcame their defeat, and in doing so, sowed the seeds for the next round in Ireland's centuries-old fight with her nearest neighbour, the War of Independence. Those of us who must die is not about promoting politics or ideology. It is simply a way of allowing the reader to walk in the shoes of the people who found themselves front and centre in some of the most intense and monumental events this city has ever seen. It's a story that gets right under your skin, but that's what it does for Darren and myself. It's something that won't let you off the book once it grips you. This book, like its predecessor, was simply something we both felt we had to do, to do our bit to record in our own way the incredible history that resonates from the city's walls. We hope to have done the story justice, 
We hope to continue to tell it as it progresses in a similar form into the future. And finally, we thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for being such an inspirational audience. I'll now hand you over to my co-author and very good friend, Darren Kelly. Thank you. This is short. Thank you first of all everyone for coming to Gillian again. Our friends, Marcus, family, Derek of course. Would love to not thank him. This is short. Not as if I'm lifting the Sam Maguire, which was quite a good one on the weekend. Well, I'm from Slag Caligar in the 1920s, Mount Joy Hunger Striker once said. The many are forgotten when we name the few. Well, I change his words around and love that by naming the many, we'll never ever forget the few. So just like when the clock struck, we like to put the reader right into the middle of events as they unfold. Like a silent watcher. Sure. Whether that be in Richmond Barracks during the ruthless elections, the court marshals, the cattle ships used for transportation, the cells in Kamenum in the hours preceding the dawn, as well as the Stonebreaker's Yard for the final minutes of those 14 who were executed. I found with this book it was a bit of a roller motion roller coaster of emotions. It was from laughter at one point, and I will gladly admit this, sitting there with tears in my eyes. But it really hits home what the men and women of 16 did for the country. It also shows the comradeship of the volunteers, the coming them on, the citizen army, all of the organisations, the officers and leaders who even though they knew they could put their lives on the line, still looked after the welfare of their men under the command. Even the young fellas refusing to reveal their age so that they could remain with their comrades who they had fought beside during the Easter week. They formed the bond that the British government and military could not and would not in the future be able to break, and which drew many others to the ranks for the coming war of independence. And on that, I will finish, I did say it short, and I'll hand you over to Ireland Stevens Billboard. Mark <laughs> 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 